Good morning and welcome to Southern Hills this morning. We do want to extend a special welcome to all of our guests and visitors, as well as those of you joining us via live stream. Again, welcome to Southern Hills. We encourage you to take a card from the pew in front of you and fill it out and uh, place it in the collection plate as it passes by this morning. I hope everyone's had a chance to pick up one of our bulletins this morning. If not, there's still plenty of copies left back in the back foyer, and it's also online at southernhills.net. Uh, but just a few announcements we'd like to make before we begin our services. Lindley Eller, a friend of Natalie Comer, sustained uh, brain trauma in a car accident on her way home from Harding over the weekend, uh, last weekend. Um, I, I understand that she is doing some better, it's slow progress, uh, but she still needs our prayers as she continues to recover. Um, also, one that we would like to add to our prayer list is Tony Orlena's mother, Elvira. Tony Orlena is a student at Bear Valley. Um, his mother is seriously ill, um, almost to the point of, of, of death. Um, also, the prayers for her, obviously, to get better, but also to listen to the gospel and, and obey the gospel at this point. So um, I know he would like for us to remember his mother, Elvira, in our prayers. And also continue to remember Beth and Jimmy Lincoln as they recover from different, uh, different hospital stays that they experienced over the last couple of weeks. Uh, there's a bridal shower coming up. Uh, for Abigail Warrens, who is the bride-elect of Corey Huey on December the 12th here at the building from 3 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. Um, more information about that is in the bulletin. Also, several things coming up today. Attention to the parents. Our youth group members will be providing babysitting all day today. Also, lunch is provided in that, so you don't have to worry about getting your children any lunch. So lunch is provided. It will be here at the building, and we'll be here till the, the services this evening. Also, with more information about our Last Leaders program is in the bulletin, page 3. I encourage you to, to take that, look at it, and read it. If you have any questions, see myself or Jennifer. Also, next Sunday evening, after our evening services, uh, December the 5th, we'll be preparing backpacks for the homeless just like we did a couple of weeks ago, but this will be for the homeless, um, um, and then we'll be planning uh, to distribute them later um, in December. Then our share group holiday brunch is coming up here at the building December the 11th at 10.30. Uh, we will put a sign-up sheet back in the back for you uh, this week for you to sign up, and also several, a lot more information about things going up, the ladies' gift gala, uh, volunteers needed to help us prepare for our services and things like that is in the bulletin. So I, I encourage you to pick a bulletin up and stay up to date on the things going on here at Southern Hills. Uh, but those are the announcements that I have for this morning. If you would, bow with me in prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, we are thankful for this time as we gather around your throne. We are thankful for the times that we spent with our families uh, over the last couple of days, thankful for the fellowship and the food that we enjoyed. Father, we pray that you be with each one of us as we enter this period of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Morning. First song this morning being number 205, Hand in Hand with Jesus, number 205.
prayer in scripture, and we'll sing number 453. Not a step without Jesus. Keeping me on my toes this morning, I see. Uh-uh. reading this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 15. Would to God be, could we bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with, with me. For I am jealous over you, and godly jealously, for I have exposed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest that by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so that your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom have not preached, or if received another spirit which have not received, or another gospel which have not accepted, you might well bear within him. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. Have I committed offense in abasing myself that you might be exhausted, because I have preached you to the gospel of God freely? I robbed other churches, taking wages of them, to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man, for which was lacking to me. The brethren which came from Macedonia supplied, and in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, so, you, so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me, in this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you, not God knoweth. But what I do, I will do, that I may cut off all occasion from them that which desire occasion, that within their glory they may be found as we. For such false apostles, deceitful workers, transform themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed also into the angel of light. Therefore, it is a great thing if his ministries and are transformed as the ministries of righteousness, and we shall be according to the works. Let's uh, pray together, if you would. Great and awesome God, Holy Father, Lord, in the quietness of this place, 
we find peace. And we thank you for that. We thank you for this church. We thank you for the encouragement and the strength that it provides. The world is a place that is wonderful in so many ways. We can see your creation all about us. But we're also mindful, Lord, that Satan is powerful and Satan is desirous of us and that there is a war that is going on that often we may overlook or not see, but we know is very present and real. We know that we are victorious through Jesus Christ. Help us not to forget that. Help us to be mindful as we come in this place together, unified in you, that we have strength, that we have hope, and that we have joy. Joy that comes to us and this hope that comes to us and this strength that comes to us because we are saved by your grace, O oh God, and that we have strength over the evil one through you. Help us to be mindful and be on guard. As we just read from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, God, as he was encouraging them to be mindful of the deceit and the evil and to be led astray. Help us as we've even been singing together to just follow you, O oh God, hand in hand. Each step that we take, O oh God, may it be through you, may it be from things that we have bathed in prayer, that we've soaked up your word as we live together with one another strengthened in you. We thank you, God. God, we thank you for prayer. We thank you that we have this opportunity that we can at any time come before you, oh God. It's hard for us to even comprehend that. But we know that you listen, we know that you are aware, and we know that you will answer. And God, we just come before you with all of the thoughts and the cares that we have, those of us all as we struggle and are weak at times, as we may have doubt or cares that seem to burden us, almost unbearable, God. We pray as your church that we continue to rally together, to strengthen one another and encourage one another. God, we come before your throne right now, again, knowing that you listen and that you hear, and knowing that some things are out of our control over those who've had some sickness and injury that have been asking for your prayers, God, and we want to do that right now. We want to pray over Elvira that was mentioned how that you would heal her body and her soul, that she might come to know you and that even in this very grave situation that you would watch over comfort and be with those that are around her and that may, she may draw into you, O oh Lord. Lord, we also want to pray for Lindley Eller. We don't understand why things happen, but we know that we live in a broken world when we know that accidents can happen. We just pray over her brain trauma, the injury that she incurred in the car wreck, and just pray, God, healing over her. Comfort and strength be with those attending to her and be with her family and be with her friends here as well. We pray as well. For Beth and Jimmy Lincoln, we love them dearly. We appreciate them so much, God, and we know they love you so dearly. And we just pray for continued recovery after their hospital stays, that you would give their bodies strength again so that we can see them again and be with them again as they strengthen us. God, we love you. We pray today as we just gather together as your people in this place that we will sing out and live out these words 
that our prayers will not be just here, but be every moment of each day. We pray over the lessons that we will receive both in classes and here in this auditorium and that be with those who've prepared so much for all of these things and pray that we will prepare our minds and our hearts and live these out so that this world may see light and may see the strength and the hope and the joy that we have in you, O God. This is our prayer. We pray in Jesus' name and amen. For the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 910, Boundless Love. Thank you. I am thankful. You probably heard an abundance of those two phrases over the past few days. Hopefully, you said it yourself. A time to be thankful. So much to be thankful for. I'm thankful that for example, my parents are now uh, residents of Spring Hill. Had the opportunity to go and have a small lunch with them in their new home. What I'm really thankful for is the sign that I saw hanging above the window in my dad's office. And it gave me pause for this morning's thoughts. That sign said, in his grasp, by his grace, for his glory. We're in his grasp. That means we are constantly blessed by the attentive eye and gracious care of our God. By his grace, We've been enriched by the gems in the treasure chest of God's grace. Those gifts include salvation, forgiveness, prayer, a living hope, peace, an abundant life. In his grasp, by his grace, for his glory. We're honored to live a life for one glorious purpose, to do everything to bring glory to our great and awesome God. Why am I thankful this morning? It's not just because it's that time of year. I'm thankful this morning because all of this was made possible by Jesus. Hebrews 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made in a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might test, taste death for everyone. And for that, I'm simply thankful. 
This morning, we have the opportunity to remember why we are here, why we are in his grasp, why we have his grace, and why our purpose in life is to live for his glory, and that's to remember Jesus' death. And let's do that right now. Our Father in heaven, we're so very thankful to be in your hands. We're so very thankful for the role that you play in our lives by your grace. And Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to live a glorious life for you. But it came with a lot of suffering by your son. As we partake of this bread, help us reflect on his body that was broken to give us all these opportunities to be thankful for. In your son's name we pray, amen. Let's continue our thoughts. Our Father in heaven, we're so very thankful for this fruit of the vine and what it represents. That beautiful blood that was shed by your son for each and every one of us. Help us keep that in our minds and our thoughts Not just today, not just this moment, but every moment that we, that we breathe, every moment that we speak with someone, every moment that we react, help us understand that it was that blood that cleanses us all. In your son's name we pray, amen.
Not only are we thankful, as we turn our attention from Thanksgiving, we turn our attention to Christmas, a time for giving. A lot of us have uh, come out of our food comas and attempted to uh, get through the Black Friday, Cyber Saturday uh, shopping, and we do it not because we enjoy the shopping part, but we do it because we enjoy what comes next, the giving, giving of gifts to those that we love and that we cherish. But this is an opportunity this time of year to not just give to those that we love, but to reflect and and understand that there are so many others that are in need. But we never need to forget that every first day of the week, every Sunday, this moment, we have the opportunity to give cheerfully. We have the opportunity to further God's kingdom to those that need it now. Don't forget that it's more blessed to give than to receive. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're so very thankful. We can't say it enough how thankful we are because of the many physical, emotional, spiritual blessings that you have given us because we are your children. Why can't we and why won't we give at this moment, so others have the opportunity to take advantage of those blessings. Father, help us, help us understand that true giving is giving to it hurts so that others can feel just a little bit better. In your son's name we pray, amen. If you'd like to mark the invitation song this morning, it'll be number 125, Do You Know My Jesus. For our lesson, we'll sing number one, excuse me, 822, Heaven Came Down, 822. Would you please stand? <clears throat>
If you have your Bibles, let me encourage you to open them to Galatians chapter 6. Uh, we're going to study verses 1 through 10 here in a moment. Uh, and I would encourage you, I know that I put the passage up on the screen. Uh, today, more so than usual, you will really benefit from having your Bibles actually open because we're gonna look a lot into Galatians chapter five as well. And I'm not gonna put that up on the screen. I've actually found it somewhat interesting here recently how much I think Galatians chapter six explains a lot of what we read in Galatians chapter five. And so I'm gonna take some time and read some from Galatians chapter five and then a little bit from Galatians chapter six and chapter six again will be up on the screen. Um, before we get to it, I'll tell you, I guess, a personal story. Um, I think many of you know that, that I'm taking some classes online, uh, and I'll probably be doing that for several years. Um, so along with the, uh, the program, the schooling that I'm doing, there's, there's some classes that I have to take that I don't get any credit for, right? That, that they are classes I have to take in order to graduate, but they don't like factor into my GPA at all, okay? Um, those classes are basically designed, it's called spiritual formation. Basically, the, the idea is that they believe that, that, that people, right? And, and, and I believe this too, along with just understanding the Bible, like there's value in, in focusing on your spiritual life as well. Or you could cram your head full of knowledge, but if you're not becoming a more spiritually minded person, there's, there's not a lot of benefit to just the, the information that is gained through school. And so along with all the classes that I have to take that, that add to the information that I'm learning, there are several classes. It's, it's basically, I'll be in this for three years, right? And like every semester there's different things that I have to do, assignments. It, it doesn't help my GPA, it doesn't hurt my GPA. I guess if I don't do it, I won't graduate, but like, like I, just, I just have to do the assignments. Um, and like, I'm, I'm just gonna be honest with you, like I, I sat back and to start the program, I looked at the assignments that I have to do and some of them I thought, well, that'll be, that'll be good. And then there were some of them that I thought, well, that's gonna be kind of a waste of time, right? And, and I'm just like, I wasn't excited about doing all of those things. I'm like, it doesn't help me. Um, in my GPA, and it's, it's just seemed somewhat like busy work, if, if I'm just going to be honest. Um, there were some assignments that I thought I'll, I'll get some, some real value out of, and I, I thought were good things to do. Um, there was one assignment that I had to do. I'm going to be honest, that, like, I wasn't looking forward to it at all. I didn't think it was going to help me. Um, and yet, having done it now for several months, I look back and I think, I think I, it actually might be among the things that I've enjoyed doing the most, or has it been at least the most beneficial? And that's journaling, okay? I've never been someone who kept a journal. I've never sat down and, and wrote out my feelings or anything along those lines. Uh, I've been encouraged to do that before, but I've just thought, ah, I don't know that I'm going to. Well, now it's actually an assignment that I have to do. Right, so I thought, okay, well, I'll go ahead and do that. And basically the idea is that three days out of the week, I do it on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I sit down and I have to write just a small little paragraph. Um, they call it a prayer journal or something along those lines that kind of tracks spiritual development. And the idea is that like at the beginning of every semester, I have to choose from Galatians chapter five, a work of the flesh and a fruit of the spirit that I have to work on. Okay, and then like I track, what am I doing to improve on those things? Um, and I'll tell you why I thought it was somewhat beneficial. Because I've, I've, I've studied Galatians chapter five a bunch. I know what, what the, the works of the flesh are. I know the fruit of the spirit. I know I need to be fighting against the works of the flesh. I need to be adding the fruit of the spirit and, and growing and developing in those ways. But I think it's been beneficial because more so than anything, it's making me think about how am I going to do that? So I say, I, I want to be better at self-control. Okay. What are you going to do to grow in self-control? And I have to write it out. Right. And, and, and so like before, like I would be like, yeah, I want to grow in self-control, but I'm not putting anything down 
this like, okay, this is what I'm going to do to have more self-control. I'm just saying I want it, right? So now like I have to like think about what am I gonna, what am I gonna do? What, what action am I gonna take to grow in that? The, the work of the flesh I'm working against it, or I'm, I'm working on is, is anger, right? Be, better, I guess, in a sense, self-control of, of emotion and think, okay, what am I doing to not get angry so often or to control my anger better, to be more fair with people? What am I doing? Am I just saying that I want to do it or am I actually doing things and taking steps to grow in those areas? And I think if anything, that the journaling has helped me think about, okay, what, what am I going to do this month or this week or today that's going to help me in those areas of my life? Um, well, I say that to say this. I've always believed that, that Christianity is a, a thought out religion. Right, it's it's something that, that God wants you to think about. I've, I've mentioned before, probably my favorite passage in Scripture is, is Ephesians five fifteen. See then that you walk carefully. Right, it's this idea of like as you're going throughout life, think about your life. Don't just go through it. Like 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 make decisions and plans and consider the things you're struggling with and the things you want to get better at and and. Think about it. We're going to be talking about doing good. And, and the encouragement, I think, is we all want to be doers of good. Okay. What is good? And what are you, what are you going to do to do that? And we'll get there in just a moment. I want to start. I've actually preached uh, from this section before with you. It's, it's, I've actually probably done it a couple of different times, but, but I want to do it and, and maybe emphasize an, another area today. So we're going to fly actually through the first couple of verses pretty quickly, and then we will turn our attention and focus more on the last couple of verses that we go through. So Paul starts by saying, brothers, if anyone is caught in any tres- transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness Keep watch on yourselves, lest you be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Okay, now now this is interesting, okay? Because I mentioned before, we're going to be reading some from Galatians chapter 5. We're going to do that in just a second. I don't know that you could really understand what Paul is saying here, unless you understand what he says in chapter 5. Like he's building on this argument that he's making. So looking in chapter 5 and verse 14 and 15. Paul says this, for the whole law is fulfilled in a word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you you bite and devour one another, watch out that you were not consumed by one another. And so throughout this book, he's been talking about the law of Moses. And what people have done is they've taken the law of Moses and they've actually used it to, to cause division and meanness and like hurt one another. And he, he's writing this thing like, you've missed the whole point. The law is fulfilled. And, and when you talk about fulfilling something, you're, taking, you're talking about like, like filling, uh, like, like bringing it to what it's supposed to be. So you have a cup of water and you fill it up. You're, you're filling it till, till, till it's, it's, in a sense, fully filled. Well, the, the law of Moses has like all of these different rules that you have to follow. And, and if at the end of the day, you, look, you take, for example, like the Ten Commandments. And you say, okay, you shall not murder. And you think, well, I hate that guy. And I want bad things to happen to him. But I'm not allowed to kill him, so I won't. Well, I, I guess you fulfilled, the, uh, you, you kept that law. You didn't murder. But you really didn't get out of that law what you're supposed to get out of it. 
Or either you say, okay, I, I, I shouldn't commit adultery. Jesus would actually give this as an example. But you look at women to lust for them. Jesus, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Like, like you're not getting, okay, so I, I, I didn't commit adultery, so I'm okay. And Jesus, no, you didn't let the law do for you what it's supposed to do for you. It's not just about don't murder. It's not just about don't commit adultery. It's not just about don't bear false witness. And all these different laws, like they all have a, a deeper, more spiritual type of meaning that there's a person God's trying to develop in you. And like, if you, if you, at the end of the day, just say, yeah, well, I didn't murder anybody and, and I didn't commit adultery and, and you know, I didn't bear false witness. Or, hey, okay, good job. But that's, that's not really what you're supposed to get out of it. All the law is fulfilled in a word. This, this is really what God's trying to get at. When, when God gave all those things, this is really what he was trying to get. Love your neighbor as yourself. And, and as he looks at the church of the Galatians, they're biting and devouring one another. They're causing division and there's meanness, but they're saying, hey, I didn't murder. And Paul's like, I'm not impressed still. Like, I don't like, he still didn't get from the law what you were supposed to get from the law. I've kind of explained it this way before. It's like raising children. And, and when you raise children, you give them some laws, man. Like, like you do. Don't hit your brother. Don't push your sister. You know, don't, 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 don't scratch each other and bite each other. Don't do those things. Guys, if, if by the time my kids are in their 20s and 30s and 40s, and, and they don't love each other, but they also don't hit each other, I don't know that I'm real happy about that. I want more out of them than just that. You give them, them, them rules as kids. Because, yeah, I mean, it's hard to teach a two-year-old, care more for your sister than you care for yourself. Two-year-olds aren't usually going to do that. But I could teach them, don't hit. Right? And that's kind of what the law was like. Don't murder Okay, what I really want from you is more than that. What is it? Love. All the laws fulfilled in a word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite, devour one another, be careful that you be not consumed by one another. Right, so now we get to chapter six. Brothers. If anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourselves lest you be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So throughout this whole book, he's talking about, you're not under the law. You're not under the law. You're not under the law. So maybe they're thinking, okay, so what deal is it? What, what does it matter to me what the law is supposed to do? And what's interesting is like throughout this whole book, he's talking about law in this negative way. But if you want to go ahead and take the idea of law and like apply it to Christ, what does Christ want? At the end of the day, what Christ wants is not a whole lot different than what the law of Moses was trying to produce. That's love. That's looking at your neighbor who's caught in transgression. That's looking at somebody who's in need and not using that as arrogance and pride. Not looking at them as something like to, like to puff yourself up over or I'm better than them or I'm more holy than them or whatever. But it's to help them with gentleness. It's to see somebody in need and care for them. That's what Christ wants. That's how we are to act. That, 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 that's what, what's what filling up Christ's desire for your behavior looks like. When you see somebody hurting and you say, I'm going to bear their burden. I'm going to help them. He goes on and says, for if anyone thinks 
He is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. So it's kind of like we, we get this really silly sometimes false sense of security in a sense or false sense of pride when I could look around and I could see the things that people are struggling in and I could say, I didn't do that. I feel pretty good about myself, right? I mean, just turn on the news. Like people are terrible. Like, and, and you just look throughout the world and they're doing terrible things. They're, they're mean and they're, they're unkind, they're violent. And I could just turn on the news and I could say, Psh, look at them. I'm not that. And I could pat myself on the back and, and, and I could be filled with pride and arrogance. And Paul says, no, you, you, want, you want something to, in a sense, be proud of. Look at yourself. It's kind of like what we were talking about at the beginning. What can I do to be, a, to be a more spiritually minded person? What can I do to do good? How can I help? And, and here's a question. As I look up, forget everybody else. If there's nobody else and it's just you, can I look at my life and say, I'm closer to God today than I was five years ago. Do I do more good today than I did five years ago? Am I better at fighting against the flesh and the desires of the flesh today than I was five years ago? Like, look at, forget everybody else, look at yourself. You want to know if you're progressing as a Christian? Are you? I want, I, I, I want to be more self-controlled. Okay. What are you doing to do that? I, I want to be more loving. Okay. What are you doing to do that? It's, it's real easy for me to feel good about myself when I look at all the terrible things that are going on in the world. But, but, but Paul's saying, forget all of that. Look at yourself. Are you growing? Are you doing good? Are, are you continuing to do good? Are you doing more good today than you were doing before? Is your life this continual progression of drawing closer to God and, and further away from the works of the flesh, closer to uh, the fruit of the spirit? Like, like is, are you being that? Also kind of fighting against pride, he says here in verse six, let the one who is taught the word share in all good things with the one who teaches, right? And so like, I can sit there and look at myself and I can, I can talk about the good things that I've done. You could look at yourselves and you could talk about the good things that you've done. Like, okay, who taught you to do that? You know, where'd you learn this? You know, I, 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 I look throughout my life and I could, I can, reach to parents, I can reach to, to preachers and teachers and, and you know, I'm, I went to school for, you know, for, for the Bible. So like, like I, I, could, I could point to a lot of different people who have helped me in my walk. Well, how about instead of like being proud and, and arrogant and, and puffing yourself up about how good you are, how about thinking about the people who actually taught you to be this way and, and sharing in the good that you were receiving with them? Okay, so we're going to go on. And, and verses 7 through 10 is really what I wanted to get to. Um, but before we do that, I want to read with you one more section from Galatians chapter 5. It's a well-known section. It it's, it's, won't be news to any of you. We've been talking a lot about the, the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Well, this is actually what he says here. But I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other. To keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality. Impurity. Sensuality. 
idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. And so that's not like an entire list, but he's giving you a pretty good list to start with. And he says, and and other stuff that's like this, he says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Okay, so you have kind of these two different ways of living. They're opposed to each other. You can't be both. For a lot of people who are sexually immoral saying, yeah, but I'm still pretty good. And he's like, no, you're not because like they, they are opposed to each other. You can't be both. You, you, you can't be both somebody who is a, a fleshly minded, physical, sowing to the flesh type of person and somebody who is a spiritually minded, good, sowing to the spirit type of a person. You cannot be both. They're opposed to each other. They're contrary to each other. With that in mind, he says this, do not be deceived. God does not mock. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. See, what he's talking about is is, is the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. You, You want to reap corruption? Just keep doing those fleshly things. And what will happen is that you will not inherit eternal life. It will destroy you. You will be corrupted by it. You want to reap eternal life, sow to the Spirit. Think about the Spirit. Do spiritual type of things. So like, what is that? Well, love, joy, and peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and gentleness, and and faithfulness, and self-control. You say, okay, well, well, what though? What things do I need to do? Interesting. With the works of the flesh, he tells you. Drunkenness, that's one of them. Sexual immorality, that's one of them. Impurity, that's one of them. Fits of anger, that's one of them. The fruit of the Spirit's a little bit different. He doesn't tell you what a loving thing is. He doesn't tell you what brings joy and peace and patience and kindness. He doesn't tell you what's good. I think he wants you to think about it. How can I show love? Sometimes we're like, just tell me. Just tell me what I need to do. And Paul's like, no. You think about it. What can you do to love somebody? To help somebody? To do good to somebody? What can you do to bring peace? Not divisions and rivalries and dissensions. That's the flesh. What can you do to bring peace? Can you give up some of your wants? Can you yield in some areas? Uh, What can you do to help somebody who's in need? And and the reality of the matter is, it's not like like the same thing this person is doing. This person, like there's a, because there's millions of good things to do. Are you doing some of it? Like what, what, are you, what are you doing? Have you thought about how can I help the person who's in need? 
the child who's in need, the, the, the elderly who's in need, the poor who are in need, the sick who are in need. Like, have you thought about what are good things that I can do to help people? And he says, like, it's, it's when you're doing that, when you're thinking about the good and you're focusing on helping and bringing peace and joy and patience and kindness and you're doing kind and loving and good things, so like, that's when you, you, you get the, the reward. And it says like the, you, you sow the good, you reap eternal life. Let us not grow weary of doing good for in due season, we will reap if we do not give up. Interesting thing about doing good is that sometimes you can sit back and you can think, what good thing can I do? How can I help somebody? And then sometimes you'll do that and you'll get no appreciation for it. There are times you could do good and people actually get angry about it. Paul spent his whole life traveling to this city and to that city, bringing them the gospel of Christ, and he was actually eventually killed because of it. And what happens sometimes is you think about all the good we can do. You can do all this good, and, and sometimes you don't get the appreciation you, you, maybe you think you should. Sometimes people um, ignore it. Sometimes people uh, belittle it or ridicule it. Um, there's all kinds of reasons why somebody would grow weary. Maybe you do good and, and not only are they not appreciative, you don't see any results. Like maybe like Paul, like he'll go to the city and he'll preach the gospel and no one listens to it. And you might think, Psh, wasted. Don't, don't, Grow weary of it. Don't give up. Don't stop doing it. Just keep doing good. Keep sowing the Spirit. Let's not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Guys, opportunities present themselves. Reality is there's things that happen that I don't have any opportunity to impact. But there's things that I do have an opportunity to do. Do it, especially to your brothers and sisters. Are there people you know who need help in one way or another? Do good to them. Help them. Be kind. Be patient. Be be somebody who is, is consciously thinking about the good that you can do. And when opportunity arises, strike, do good. Everybody, especially especially to the household of faith, don't grow weary in it. Throughout your life, do good. And the promise is that you'll reap what you'll get from. Maybe you do good and you don't think you get anything back. No, you'll get something back. It is eternal life because that is fulfilling what what Christ wants. His his rule, his law, like what, what does Christ, that's it. Do good. Love your neighbor as yourself. Look for opportunities. And when you have opportunities, do good to everybody and especially those of the household of faith. If there's anyone in here who's not yet a Christian, we would love to give you the opportunity to become one. If we can study with you or pray with you, 
we can baptize you. If there's anything we can do to help you in your walk with God, we want to give you this opportunity to sit on one of the front rows while we stand and sing this invitation song. class following this song of prayer. Final song will be number 738. We will glorify. Number 738. Please bow as we go to God in prayer. 
Thank God for this day you've given us to come together and worship with one another and learn more about you with one another. Thank you for the beautiful day and weather you've given us. Thank you for the roof over our heads and the technology we have to worship with one another. Please help everyone go to class and learn more and help the teachers teach what you might have taught and help us grow closer to you each and every day. Thank you for Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, that we have a path to heaven and an opportunity to live for eternity with you. In his name, amen.